Hey everyone, Diavolo here, and today we are jumping into a completely different series that I've seen a bunch of you requesting down below. Solo leveling is one of those journeys where we follow one man on his quest to become the strongest in a constant battle against both man and monsters. Unlike a bunch of manga that I shan't name, this manhwa doesn't stray into the confusing, philosophical, or profound. Instead, it's extremely easy to read and lets the art along with the brilliant fight scenes take a hold. Don't get me wrong, the story also has a great deal of substance and interesting concepts, they just don't make that the overall focus of the story itself. The focus is always seemingly on Jin Wu and his quest to become the strongest. In this video, we're going to cover the first arc that takes place throughout the series, D-Rank Dungeon Arc. This arc is a fantastic way to enter the world of solo leveling. While focusing on the main character, his initial strengths and weaknesses, we are slowly fed information that allows us to gain an even greater understanding of the world that everyone finds themselves in. It seems to be one like our own. However, 10 years earlier, a random event led to a massive change in the world. If you want to find out more, subscribe, push this video to 3k likes so I know that you all want the next arc, and sit back and relax as we delve into the first part of solo leveling. Kicking things off in Seoul, South Korea, apologies to my Hyongs for what's probably a terrible accent for a Korean pronunciation, either way, we find the world's weakest hunter, E-Rank, Sung Jin Woo. Walking through the streets, brooding over his ridiculously weak self, Jin finds it embarrassing to even call himself a hunter. Being a hunter is a job where you place your life on the line in the hopes of great return. However, Jin isn't doing this because it's his choice. Meanwhile, in a construction site, the infamously known weakest hunter, Sung Jin Woo, arrives to join the other hunters in a raid. Looking over at him walk past, one returning hunter, Bark, questions if he's powerful as everyone is happy to see him. Kim though points out that it's actually the opposite. He's the world's weakest and finds it tough to even get through an E-rank dungeon. Figuring that since he's here, it's most likely an extremely weak dungeon, Kim tells his boy to quiet his voice since he might overhear them talking, to which it's revealed that Jin had actually heard the entire conversation. Trying to clear his mind, Jin asks for a coffee, however, to his dismay, finds out that they'd just run out. Feeling absolutely terrible about this, the barista apologizes to Jin as he walks off, a bit let down. All of a sudden, Ju He screams out, noticing that he's all beaten up. Sitting down together, the two chat for a brief moment about how Jin was sent to hospital following an expedition into an E-rank dungeon. Getting up, Jin tells her that they might as well head over since it looks like everyone is about to head in. Gathering everyone around, Song Chiel asks if it's alright to take the role as team leader for this raid. Everyone agrees and shortly following this, he heads inside, telling everyone to follow him forth into the dungeon. Gaining confidence, Jin Woo tells himself to try his best today and enters the portal last behind everyone else. Watching everyone leave in front of him, the dude from the coffee stand tells his boy that he feels a bit shit since he wasn't able to give Jin a coffee before he headed in. Now in the dungeon, Jin Woo is found already being healed by Ju He and apologizing for his lack of skills. All around them, the other members of the group take care of the remaining monsters. Thinking that the raid is almost done now, Jin Wu looks over to see everyone in a group talking. Above their heads, you can see a symbol representing something. These different colors and symbols each correlate to a member's affinity. Snapping him back, Juhi asks if he has a reason, one stopping him from leaving. Not wanting to reveal his own personal hell, Jin laughs while expressing that he does this for the fun of it, otherwise he'd actually die of boredom. Nearby, Song, holding a crystal in his hand, explains that this thing is a magical core, an item someone receives after killing a monster. Magical cores from even a C-rank monster is worth thousands, yet sadly since Jin is an E-rank hunter, C-ranks are a mere impossibility for him to achieve. Holding the pathetic E-rank core in his hand, Jin thinks it's a bit small after putting his all into this dungeon. As he becomes even more disheartened, a random yells out that they found another entrance. Standing in front of the gaping cave entrance now, Song explains that the thing in front of them is most likely a double lair. Sparking up his magical flames, Song beautifully twists a torrent of fire and shoots it forth a distance down the tunnel. Watching it continue through the air, the flame hits the ground before slowly fading back to black. Getting everyone's attention, Song elaborates that the gate actually won't close if the boss is still alive. Due to the gate not closing yet, it's evident that the boss is most likely down the tunnel. Usually, they'd need to contact the guild, but if other people get the profits first, then their own profits will dwindle. 
Looking at all of them, he instead proposes a vote on if they should venture forth to kill the boss. Since there are 17 of them, it will result in one side winning, and no matter what, they shouldn't complain about what happens. After a few moments, it's shown that the votes came back 8 to 8, with it all depending on Jinwoo's vote if they venture forth. Knowing he doesn't have enough money and soon needs to pay for his sister to attend college, plus look after his sick mother in hospital, Jinwoo announces that he is going, meaning that all 17 of the hunters will push further into the dungeon. Wondering how long it's been since everyone entered the cave, someone mentions that it's been around 40 minutes and the gate will close an hour after the boss is defeated, so right now they have about 20 minutes spare to escape. Walking together, Jin Woo apologizes to Ju He for forcing her to come in here after voting yes. Being told he doesn't need to worry, Jin pushes further to get the truth, only for Ju He to rage out and tell him that no, she currently is not okay. Screaming if he's mental, Ju He reveals that the wound Jin initially received, the one that, you know, we never saw him get, was a stab wound that entered just below where his heart is. Coming to see that he really is only alive because of her, Jin apologizes for dragging her into this once more. Smiling, Chu He hints that if he really is sorry, maybe he should take her out for some food to prove it. Blushing, but unable to say anything, Chu He asks him if he doesn't want to, to which he snaps out of the daze and accepts the date. Finally, after a few more minutes, the group end up finding a large, golden and purple door. Asking those following if they want to return empty handed or not, Song begins pushing the door open while saying that they could be the first ones to ever enter this section. Creaking open the door and entering the room, blue flames ignite, alighting the room and revealing the large, circular space that lays before them. Expecting to face magical beasts, the team is confused and notes that it looks as if no one has been here in ages. Statues surround the room, some holding weapons, some holding instruments. The atmosphere makes Jin's hair stand on edge and he feels as if someone is literally staring down on him. Not wanting to be caught up with negative feelings, Jin examines the massive statue that's seated in the center back of the room. He assumes it isn't the boss as it's only a statue, however, it's the only one this large. By the way, all the other statues in the room, like in the light novel, they're actually only as tall as all of the people as well, or like slightly taller than all of the people in the room. They're not massive like statues like we see here. The only massive one is meant to be the one in the chair, but you know, obviously things change from webcomic to, you know, like the light novel and everything. Anyways, anyways, looking down, Song randomly finds a moss-covered magic seal. Yelling out to him, another of the crew calls him over to read some ancient text. Moving over to the text board, Song begins reading out Carthenon's temple commandments. First, worship the Lord. Second, praise the Lord. Third, prove your faith. Being tapped on the shoulder, Jin turns around to hear Juhi exclaiming that the statue's eyeball just moved. Thinking that she's gotta be tripping, suddenly Jin starts to feel an aura he hadn't before. The air became chill and all noise stopped. With that, Song announces to the group that anyone who does not follow the previously mentioned rules will never return alive. Slamming behind them, everyone's heads snap back to see the previously open entrance has slammed shut. Annoyed with everyone spouting nonsense, one of the team members announces that, you know, he's out of here, they can have whatever treasures they find, but he's done. Wishing them good luck, he places his hand upon the door, only to hear Song scream out for him to wait. Before his voice even reaches the hunter, a shadow shoots through the room and cleaves the man down. Instantly following this, the statue returns to its position and lowers the weapon. Horrified to witness the statue come to life, the team members are all left speechless knowing that if they want to leave, they need to destroy these statues. Jin Woo, remembering a previous statement, flicks his head around to see the main statue now staring right back at him. Thinking about the guy who just died, Jin knows he was only D rank. Even if he was only a weak D rank, he still would have been stronger than an E rank like himself. For like obviously those who are confused with the ranking system inside of solo leveling, simply it starts with E, then it goes up from there with D, C, B, A, and then finally the strongest at S rank. The anime has done things slightly differently as you could tell, not with like the power system or anything like that, instead it's added a few other interactions with characters that never happened in these initial chapters, I think it was like like a, like a pre-chapter or something, I haven't actually read it before so I don't know. I think it's good because it kind of like expands the world a little bit more and shows us that other things are happening at the same time while this is also going on. 
However, I do hope that A1, which is the studio that is taking on solo leveling here, sticks with mainly Jin's point of view like we get throughout the story or get throughout the webcomic and doesn't get too caught up in other things too early on. The pacing right now is looking like four to five chapters per episode. So I'm assuming over the 12 episodes, we're probably gonna get around 55 to 60 chapters, possibly even more throughout this first season. It just depends on how the pacing is for like other arcs and everything. But that's kind of like how I'm feeling right now. Anyways, anyways, confused because this dungeon was meant to be D rank at most, Jin swears that he's never heard of monsters as strong as these inside of a D rank dungeon. In a flashback, we find that this wasn't the first time Jin almost died. During the first raid he ever went on, he accidentally left the group and got lost. Then, out of nowhere, a random E rank goblin shanked him from behind, sending him straight to the hospital for weeks. Another time, he almost starved to death after being trapped inside because his entire team had left. Other people in like the solo leveling world usually use their magical cores to trade up for better weapons, to then fight stronger monsters and earn even more money. Jin however can't do this. He never holds a weapon, so like that little blade you do see in the anime as well, I don't think that ever happens, it would just break anyway like he says right here. Having a healer means that his injuries are able to get healed, but only if it wasn't too extreme. Though, that means that that healer has to work twice as hard, babysitting some weakling who can actually barely look after himself. Every time Jin got injured and heard their sneering remarks, all the times he continued a job that may result in his demise, maybe it was all for this one moment here. Reacting just in time, Jin Woo screams out for all of his comrades to duck. Hearing his warning, some hunters stand there stationary, watching the statue's eyes begin to glow. Suddenly, a beam of light is sent out that utterly eviscerates anything in its path. Opening their eyes and seeing what remains of the group, the hunters' horror only furthers as they notice that a large portion of them were taken out with a single blast. Making himself heard, Song yells for everyone to not stand up and remain in their positions. If they choose to stand back up now, the statue will 100% attack them again. With everyone listening, Song creeps over to Jin and lets him know that even though Juhi is a B rank healer, she can't handle fear at all. While talking with Song, Jin notices that almost all of his fellow hunter's arm was blown off by the previous attack. Asking to be bandaged up, Song looks up at the giant statue and questions his boy about what rank it looks like it could be to him. Not knowing due to like never having even stepped a foot in a dungeon higher than D rank, Song, who's you know actually somewhat experienced and has been in a B rank dungeon a few times, is certain that this being definitely exceeds that of a B rank boss. This one, he guesses that it could possibly even be an S rank creature. Thinking on the spot, Jin remembers the commandments that Song had read out earlier. Worship the Lord, praise the Lord, and prove your faith. Those who do not follow the commandments will never return alive. To Jin, it's obvious, he thinks that the giant godlike statue seated in front of him is that lord. In solo leveling, these dungeons exist in a different time space or dimension. To get there, something called a gate is needed to be used. This gate is a sort of tunnel that connects other random worlds to their own. Ten years earlier, after the first gate randomly appeared in the world, many people began to experience random events. One of these random events to happen were the modification of humans into hunters. The moment a hunter is chosen, their strength stays the same and it is impossible to change. Jin too became a hunter, however, his strength was only enough for an E rank rating. Still, Jin is stronger than most individuals, it's just that the difference between him and other ranks is extremely drastic. The men and women who received the powers to cross the gate and destroy monsters as a career were labelled as hunters. Sometimes, on odd occasions, beyond the gate, there can be an ominous, despairing, insane monster that comes out of absolutely nowhere. Wondering if he's going to be okay, Jin asks if Song's bleeding will stop, but Song says there really isn't much he can do about it now. Initially, he'd brought three healers here because he thought this would be over quickly. Now, one literally got vaporized by the first attack and the other is so shocked that he's unable to move. Even the B rank healer Chu He has never experienced anything like this, so it's making healing slightly difficult for the time being. For Song, he thinks that the best course of action is to stand still, then once the situation clears a tad, try and make a run for it. 
Suddenly, one of the random hunters breaks away from the group while claiming that this isn't his final moment. He finally managed to join a big guild, so he won't die here. Gritting his teeth, the man gasses himself up and plans to use enough speed to burst through the doors in an instant. Boosting off and sending rocks flying with tremendous speed, the hunter begins closing in on the door. All of a sudden though, a burst of light shoots through the room, evaporating the hunter and leaving nothing but his feet remaining. Groaning with rage, another hunter questions why it is that the monsters are taking their time when they could just take them out whenever they feel like it. Thinking that this is completely different from the typical monsters who just blindly attack on sight, Jin is able to deduce that the statues seem to attack in a sort of pattern. Snapping his head back towards something, he figures that it has to be. There has to be a rule to how this room works. Analyzing the commandments of Carthanon, Jin realizes that this is the key to surviving the room. Asking what the first commandment was, Song reminds him that it was to worship the Lord. Pondering what this could possibly mean, Jin starts to get up while explaining that there is a rule to this dungeon. Making his way over towards the statue, Jin watches as the eyes begin to glow and immediately drops to the floor, sweat starting to drip from his brow. Seeing the glow in the eyes fade, he assumes that the bean will start to attack if the targeted person moves past a specific height. Understanding an aspect of the statue now, Jin Wu tells everyone to bow down before it. Wondering if he's gone mad or something, Song asks if he's managed to figure something out. Replying yes, Jin explains that, like I've said, the bean attacks those who move past a certain height. The phrase, worship the lord, literally means bow down and worship him. Following the E-Ranker's orders, everyone bows down and begins worshipping the statue in front of them. Looking down on them, the light from the statue's eyes randomly disappears. Snapping open, the concrete grin of this grotesque being opens up and its eyes turn red, ominously looking down on all of the fodder hunters below it. Feeling its gaze violating them, Jin wonders how many this creature has attacked in the past. How many people in their group are still alive? How long do they have to lay down here and do this in front of this thing? Starting to rise back up to his feet, Bark starts to think that the creature stopped and instead of continuing to make them bow, will try something else soon. He doubts that just because they bowed down, everything is going to turn out fine. One by one, everyone slowly begins rising back to their feet after seeing that the monster has indeed stopped attacking. Suddenly, the room begins to shake and the statue itself begins rising from the seat. Stomping on the floor, everyone looks up in horror knowing that this entire fiasco isn't over. Towering above them like a monolithic demonic god, all of the hunters stand there in fear, unable to move or say anything. Stepping forth, Song screams at Jin for any more ideas, but due to the frantic nature of the dungeon, he's unable to think of anything. Quickly snapping out of it, he remembers the roles that he started going over earlier. Knowing that the next line of commandments was to praise the Lord, Jin guesses that it has to be the key to solving this. Speaking up, another random hunter announces that he's got this. Back in the day, he was a member of a church choir, so his lungs are literally built for praising. Grabbing a hold of his cross, the hunter closes his eyes and starts to approach the Lord. Not stopping under fear of death, the hunter sings for the Lord to make him anew. As everyone stands around, they wonder if it's working or not, and Bark even thinks that the creature's started to move slightly slower now. Jin though, man's dripping in a cold sweat since he's come to realize it. The hunter is actually praying to the wrong god. With that, the statue steps down, flattening the ex-Christian below its gigantic foot. Screaming and turning away in fear of the seemingly inevitable, some of the people even decide to start running away in hopes of living for just a moment longer. Terrified and unable to move, Juhi screams her final words as the statue squishes her as well. JK though, big simping Jin was able to double back and quickly tear her away in time. Running now, Song tells everyone to split up in an attempt to figure out what to do next. By himself, Bark thinks back on his wife and the life that he had with his family, while reiterating that he cannot die here. He's determined to be a father to his two children, but this is. Thinking he finally found a safe location to chill out, Kim screams out for his mate to watch his back and turn around. Unable to react in time, the statue cleaved downwards, slicing our boy Bark in two and sending him straight into the Shadow Realm. Just like before, the statue then returns to its original position. Over the other side of the room, Jin runs with Zhu He from the statue, wondering how the hell he's meant to praise a god he doesn't even know. Analyzing the room, he knows that the entire place is encircled with large guards and a colossal statue centered at the back. If one gets too close to a statue, it automatically attacks them in an instant. 
Randomly, as he looks at each individual statue, he sees a woman holding a trumpet. Wondering if they attack with instruments as well, Jin knows the others only attack if you get too close. Once you are close, it's all a predetermined move set. Figuring that he's probably on the right track here, Jin yells out to the remaining people to run towards the statues with instruments. Seeing that he was already next to one, Song looks over to see the statue begin playing a dank tune. Backing up Jin's statement, he tells the others that the statues holding instruments do not attack. Finding a statue of his own, Kim breaks down over the loss of his close friend Bark. Honestly, it's pretty rough for the man. Dude decided to return to the hunter life only to get literally rickrolled by some demonic god's little game in his first dungeon back. It's, that's, that's, so, that's the worst RNG you could possibly have. Sprinting over to the other side of the room, both Chin and Juhi stand underneath a man with a drum. However, it refuses to begin playing until only one remains. Darting off, Jin makes a mad dash towards the next closest instrument. Looking over at the fleeing rat beneath itself, the statue then moves to stomp on Jin. Telling himself to push just a tad further, Jin is able to dodge the foot that goes to stomp down on him. However, the subsequent stomp sends him uncontrollably tumbling forwards. Stunned and unable to move, Jin can only watch as he slides straight towards a shield-wielding statue. Thrusting downwards, the statue seemingly pushes its shield into the ground and destroys the concrete floor as Jin slides into it. Juhi screams out in a hope that he somehow made it out alive. Bloody and barely able to move now, Jin pleads with whatever force is above for something to appear in front of him. Rising to his feet and holding on to the thread that connects him to life or death, he slowly starts to feel like now, even that line may break. Closing his eyes for the impending doom that's about to happen, the voice of an angel suddenly begins singing out. Below it, we see that our boy, laid out, has somehow managed to get lucky and find a statue. Laughing at the luck he seems to have, we then see that due to all of the music being played, or a song being sung, the Lord statue has stopped dead in the center of the room. Moments later, Juhi sprints over to Jin and asks him if he's alright. Jin tries telling her that he's alright, however, after arriving and seeing the terrible state that he's currently in, missing a foot, Juhi breaks down crying. Feeling terrible and probably thinking it's her fault that Jin lost his foot, Juhi puts all her effort into making sure that his wound is healed. Out putting too much magic though, blood spurts from her nose and she collapses next to Jin. Thankful that at least Jin somehow managed to survive, Kim points out how the group's numbers are quickly being whittled away, from 17 to only 6, and two of those surviving members are already gravely injured. Finding it unfortunate that Song lost his arm, Kim reminds him that this is all because he made a rash decision as the party leader. Warning him about the impending punishment for losing so many members, Song, heavy hearted, agrees with what he's saying. Moving once more, everyone's attention is quickly brought back to the statue. Raising its left hand, everyone feels the ground shake uncontrollably before in front of them, a table-like object bursts through the floor. Once the summoned platform finishes moving, flames then also appear in the sky around the outskirts of the room. Looking at the summoning in front of them, Kim wonders what it could be, only for Jin to say that it's an altar. Elaborating to the other five members, he assumes it's one from like an ancient mythology where they sacrificed living beings for their lord. Backing up his assumption, he reiterates that the final commandment was to prove your faith. Suddenly, a light appears in the stomach of Kim and the man begins withdrawing a blade from a small gateway-like opening. Even though he thinks he's dumb, Kim understands that this likely means they need to sacrifice someone. Pointing his sword towards the gravely injured Song, Kim demands that the man who brought them here steps forwards. In his mind, Kim feels like Song is responsible for all 11 deaths that have happened so far. Plus, he also just agreed to take responsibility for them before. Seeing where he's coming from, Song agrees on taking responsibility, but asks for him to lower the sword and let him walk freely ahead. Behind them, Jin full on disagrees with what's going on. In his mind, he doesn't think it's his fault. They all technically voted to come in here and it's just cowardly to turn around and say it's his issue now. Stumbling up to the altar though, Song stares down at the weirdly decorated pattern on top of it. Randomly, a normal flame ignites behind him, causing Kim to scream out and ask, what the hell is happening now? Confused, Jin asks if this isn't what they were supposed to do. Unable to understand what the flame means or if the god wanted a sacrifice to start with, Jin asks the four remaining people in front of him if they could also carry him up to the altar. 
being carried in by the large guy and other female, Jin notices that as soon as they enter the circle, three more flames ignited. Asking Song if he thinks the others will save them if they decide to stay here, Song begins explaining a feature of how these gates actually work. For them right now, it marks one week since the gate was opened. The statues will start moving before reinforcements even get to this part of the dungeon. The reason this even matters is because after one week of a dungeon being open, monsters inside of the gate can actually come through and enter their own world. The entire purpose of a raid to begin with is to kill the boss and close the gate before the time runs out. If the people inside of the dungeon fail these tasks right now, it will mean the monsters commanding them to do all these random tasks can freely enter their own world. Turning to the final two members, Jin tells them that they should come here as well. For every person that steps on the altar, a flame appears, and he thinks that the trial won't begin until everyone's here. Listening to him and proceeding to stand on the altar themselves, blue lights suddenly shoot along the ground out to the outer edge of the altar where it lights a corresponding blue flame. Looking at the ant-sized people below it, the statue waves its hand once more, causing the door over the other side of the room to swing open. Standing there stunned, everyone wonders what the hell they should do now. Adding to the already intense situation, every stone statue around the circumference of the room slowly begins enclosing in on the group. Randomly, Jin looks from statue to statue and sees their movement cease the moment his eyes look at them. Turning to Ju He, he tells her that she cannot close her eyes here. It's just like when they were kids. The statues will only move when you take your eyes off them. Kind of like the coil heads from Lethal Company, but the movement speed is absolutely nerfed. Anyways, anyways, closing her eyes in fear and listening to the statue take another step, the other female hunter screams out in terror before darting off in an attempt to escape. Once she leaves the circle, one of the flames around the outside of the altar vanish and she seemingly runs through the doorway unharmed. Absolutely confused with what the hell they just witnessed, everyone questions Jin how she's still alive. Plus, on top of that, when she did exit the door, it slightly closed. Trying to think, Jin presumes a blue flame will disappear after a set amount of time. One of the red flames that appeared based on the number of people also vanished the moment she left the circle. Due to how straightforward the rules have been so far, Jin comes to the conclusion that the door is a trap, a false hope. The door only opened after the red flames appeared and closes just slightly every time one of the same flames disappear. Prove your faith for Jin is literal, meaning that even in terror and danger, with the sweetest of temptations, keep your faith true. Apologizing to Jin though, the big dude who carried him over earlier says he doesn't think he can take much more of this. Throwing Jin to the floor and leaving him helpless, the man runs off towards a supposed false hope. Watching another leave in front of him, Kim is just baffled that once again, someone ran out. Screaming out that no one can move though, Jin explains that if anyone else decides to leave and they're only stuck with three people, the rest will not be able to survive. Needing an elaboration on what's happening, Song asks Jin for more info, to which she tells him that all they need to do is stay still and watch the statues until the blue flames disappear. The blue flames are a timer and once they run out, everyone will be able to leave freely. Kim tells them that yeah, he may be right, but the door could also just slam shut, sealing them in here when the blue flames run out as well. Throughout all of the previous dungeons he's gone through with Jin, Kim never imagined someone as weak as him would be helpful. He always looked down on him and never really expected anything from him. A lot of people initially died when they got here, but the ones who are alive are because of his quick thinking. Kim thanks him for everything so far. However, as he throws his sword to the ground, begins tearing up. He reveals he also has a family and doesn't want to die just yet. Not being able to take the fear of death anymore, Kim apologizes one more time before leaving the circle and making a run for freedom. With tears in his eyes, Jin drops to the floor utterly pissed off with everyone's apparent selfishness. Now that Kim's run, the remaining three have no chance. It's doomed them to a cruel death. Looking defeated about what's just happened, Song points out that the door's nearly closed. It's too late now, but he finally understands what, what's actually going on. Knowing that the door won't close as long as there's at least one person on the altar, Song tells the others to leave, since they naturally have a lot more life to live. Turning to Ju He, he asks if she'd be able to help Jin out of the room, to which she instantly agrees. Sadly though, Ju He collapses to the floor before she's even able to attempt picking Jin up. Seeing her legs shaking, Juhi cries out that they won't move at all. 
sadly, and due to Juhi using too much mana in an attempt to heal Jin previously, she's exhausted herself to the point that she can no longer move herself, which means that two of them are now incapacitated. Taking the old dude's place, Jin tells him that he should instead take Juhi out of here. Disagreeing, Song tries saying that he'll stay, but obviously Jin points out that no one will be able to carry Juhi, plus there's no time, they need to run. Screaming out, she'd rather stay here, Jin reminds her that he promised he'd buy Juhi dinner sometime. Pulling out his pathetic E-rank core, Jin tells her to eat the dinner first, then once he returns, he'll find her for that payment. Going to say something, Juhi is sadly and quickly knocked out as Song picks her up and tells Jin there really isn't any more time to wait. Asking the old man to take care of her, Song promises that he will before slowly making his leave with Juhi. Seeing them escape through the door to safety, Jin thanks God as at least he's the only one that's dying now. It's an interesting aspect, like think about how in like that moment there he weirdly praises God thanking him that he's the, the only one who's dying here. I don't know, it's just something that I've noticed as I've begun scripting this series, and it's almost unintentional from his side, but I'm curious as to if it held any credence in the actual story itself. I assume that it didn't, and it's probably just words. Feeling like an idiot anyway, Jin beats himself up over not having got a life insurance in case of this happening. Looking over and seeing Kim's sword on the ground, he picks it up and decides that in his final moments, he's going to at least take one of these monsters down with him. Bloodshot eyes and completely unable to stand due to his missing foot, Jin points his blade forth and tells the monster to come. That's an interesting thing to ask a monster to do, but either way, in a flash, the closest monster strikes down on Jin, ripping through his chest with a complete ease. Coughing blood and screaming in pain, the monster doesn't stop. Instead, it removes its spear, flinging Jin up into the air. Falling down now atop the altar and barely breathing, our boy exclaims that he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to die. Tears pour from his eyes and thoughts begin to rush his mind. This isn't fine. What do you mean thankful? Done with everything, he questions why everyone betrayed him. He also has a family. He also doesn't want to die. Remembering he said that he's glad he's the only one dying, Jin tells himself he's a freaking liar. He, he never wanted to die. Now laying there and watching his life come to its close, Jin wishes that he had just one more chance. Striking downwards, suddenly, the altar erupts with a plethora of different lights and flames. The blade from the statue slowly begins to come to a stop until it ceases, stuck in time. Confused, he wonders what the hell this could be. Looking closer, the random screen reads, Alarm! You, sir, are dank and have completed all necessary requirements of the secret quest, Courage of the Weak. Still acting blazed because dude's got a hole in his chest and probably can't really even read the screen correctly, Jin can't seem to even comprehend what just happened. Suddenly, another screen pops up asking if he will accept the right to become a player. Then another reminding him that he doesn't have much time at all remaining. If he actually refuses this random request, then his heart will stop approximately 0.02 seconds after. Realizing that if he accepts, he doesn't need to die, Jin takes it. Welcoming him as a player, Jin's bruised, cut and limp body is suddenly engulfed by beams of light so bright that he's physically hidden from view. I guess that is one way to end the first arc of the series on a more or less cliffhanger, which, like, we all know, dude's absolutely fine. Otherwise, I don't know what all this, like, finished light novel jargon or the almost 100 chapters of a webtoon would be about. Though it would be pretty funny if Man killed his main character at chapter 10, then decided to recreate him. Funnily enough, I guess in a way he kind of does do that. Like Man was 0.02 seconds off dying, and well, you've seen what comes next. Man's a completely different person. Speaking of next, if you have all enjoyed this D rank dungeon art for solo leveling, then please make sure to push this video to 3000 likes so I know you all want more and check out the webcomic for yourselves. It's honestly a really, really easy read. No brain power at all needed. It's just the typical brute hype fest and I love that. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And of course, it's all in color as well, which is even better. If you happen to be new around here, well, then subscribe and check out the multitude of different series that I've covered now. Either way, thank you all for 200,000 subscribers again. It's actually insane to see how far we've come over the years, but for now, it's been your professional degenerate, Diavolo, and I will see you all in a bit. Bye.